as we look at these, these last few chapters of the book of Mark, and Jesus is on his way to the cross, and <clears throat> we just finished the Olivet Discourse in, uh, in chapter 13, which all of the Gospels repeat, all the synoptic Gospels repeat for us. And it's a sermon, and so, so we're kind of changing gears here. And uh, Mark chapter 13, pretty much the entire chapter is a sermon of Jesus. Mark chapter 14, we go back to the story, back to the narrative. And so here's the question for you this morning. How do you want to be remembered? Because what we're going to look at is we're going to look at, at three different people, three different, one, one group and then, and then two other people this morning. And ask yourself the question, how do you want to be remembered when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ? So let's read together after two days, Mark chapter 14, verse 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she break the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves <clears throat> and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Let's pray together. Father, help us, we pray, understand the Bible. Help us to just listen, have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, we've got, we've got three different people or groups, one group and then two other people that are going to be reacting to and interacting with the Lord Jesus Christ in this. The first group is just this, the sneaky plan to kill Jesus. The sneaky plan to kill Jesus. It says there that it's two days, uh, after two days was the feast of the Passover. And you've got to remember now, when the Bible talks about the Passover, it talks about it in two different ways. The Passover was one particular day. It was the 14th day of Nisan on the Jewish calendar, okay? But the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a week-long feast that the Passover fit into. And so sometimes when it talks about the fat Passover, it's talking about that whole feast, the whole week of Unleavened Bread. Sometimes when it talks about the Passover, it's talking about a particular day, okay? And so I'm not going to go into this today, but let me ask you a question. How did Jesus and his disciples eat the Passover and then he also die on the Passover? Well, you got to tune in next time to find out. But anyway, this is the, the Passover is coming and he tells us there, he says, the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take him by craft. Now, what does that mean? Well, the word craft means a decoy. When you go duck hunting, you put out a few decoys and you try to trick the ducks that are coming in to think that everything's okay in that particular area of the water. So, so it means a trick. It means a, 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 to use subtlety. And so they actually get together, the chief priests, they get together and they say, Let's come up with a subtle, sneaky plan because we want to kill him, all right? Now, we've seen this. They decided uh, way back earlier in his ministry they wanted to kill him. They're just, they're just looking for the right time. But notice what they say. 
But they said, verse 2, not on the feast day. What day is Jesus going to be crucified? He's going to be crucified right on the feast day. So how, how is that? that? They don't want this to happen on that particular day. But who's in charge here? That's the thing that you need to realize and understand. They are trying to come up with this sneaky plan, but Jesus is in charge. You see, Jesus is going to die as the Passover. The Bible tells us that Christ, our Passover, was sac sacrificed excuse me, for us. So, so it, it, this is God's plan, and God is in absolute control of this whole situation. Might not look like it. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they think that they're in control, but they're not. But they don't want, they said not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. You see, they're scared of the people. The people love Jesus. The teachers of the law, they don't like Jesus. And so what they need is they need to get him at a place where there's not a big crowd around. The only times they, they really see him, there's a big crowd. He's in the temple courts or something like that. And they know if they just come and grab him and arrest him, they know that, that the people won't go for it. So they've got to come up with some kind of a sneaky plan. I just want to, I want, I want you to ask yourself the question, do you want to be remembered like that? Do you, want to, <laughs> do you want to be remembered as the people who had to get rid of Jesus because he messed with their religious system? Uh, he, he challenged their religious views? I don't think you do. Number two, the sacrificial anointing for his burial. The sacrificial anointing for his burial. Look at verse 3. Being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. Now, if Simon were still a leper, they wouldn't have been in his house. So, apparently, Simon is one of the, who knows how many people Jesus has healed. He's one of those guys who used to be a leper. He's so much, he spent so much time as a leper. Everybody knew him as Simon the leper, but now he's been healed by Jesus and he's hosting Jesus, hosting a meal in his home as the, as the people came into uh, Jerusalem for the Passover, they, they, would, they would stay in other people's homes. And we're going to see that even the disciples, they, they use a, a borrowed room to have the Passover because all of these pilgrims are going to flood into Jerusalem. And so Simon opens up his home, and he's from Bethany. Can you remember who else is from Bethany? Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They live in Bethany as well. And, and Lazarus is present at this meal. I'll show you in just a minute. <clears throat> but Simon used to be a leper. Apparently he's been healed by Jesus. And so they're there in his house. And it says he sat at meat. And there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard. Very precious. Alabaster is a type of marble that is soft enough that you can actually carve it. And so when you think of this box, you and I, when we use the word box, we think of something rectangular or square. I want you to think of a, a bottle that's like a flask with a long neck, most probably. That long neck would allow them to take and just get a dab. And so the traditional custom of the day as people came into the house is someone would have some perfume and they might just dab a little bit on them. And it's spikenard. It's, it's this a precious perfume from India. It grows with these teeny tiny little flowers. And meticulously, they would have to harvest these little flowers and dry them out and mash them down to make this aroma. So, you know, little bitty tiny flowers takes a whole bunch of them to get this perfume. So this stuff is very, very expensive. Okay? Matter of fact, it says there in verse 4, there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? Because what this woman is going to do is she's going to take that vial and she's going to break the neck off of it so she can get it to dump out. How many of you use Old Spice? Anybody use Old Spice? Come on now. a boy. I like Old Spice. Old Spice, Stetson, and High Karate. Those are the ones that I use. But anyway, it's just a suggestion for you. All right. So an Old Spice bottle, it would take you a long time to pull the little deal off and to try to dump it all out. Well, that's the way that these bottles would have been designed. So if you break the neck off of it, you can dump it all out, right? That's what she did. She came, she broke it. Bam! There's a good chance 
that this was a family heirloom. There's a good chance that this was handed down to her by her mother or grandmother or someone like that. This is the kind of thing that you use for multiple generations because you're just going to use a little dab. A little dab will do you. And some of y'all need to learn that lesson when it comes to the lesson of perfume and cologne, right? And just a dab, just... Anyway. <clears throat> why? Why did they do this? Because they didn't have right guard. That's why. Because they didn't have air conditioning. That's why. And because it stank. And so when you came in, they would wash your feet because you walked around dirty old streets and you walked around with animals being pulling wagons and things on those streets and there was dirt and there was mud and there was manure and there was all that kind of stuff and so a host would wash your feet and a host would give you a little dab of perfume so you didn't stank up the whole house it was just the way that it was because they were all going to go in there and eat and sweat okay and so it's it's custom this woman breaks custom she breaks the bottle she anoints jesus completely and it, it says there in verse 5, it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. That pence, the word pence, is the Greek word denarii, and that is a day's wages. So you're talking about something that would have cost a year's working wages. These are poor folks. To take something that cost a year's working wages and just dump it. This would have lasted generations. It was so, they'd never seen anybody do anything like this ever before. It was so disturbing to them that it says some of them had indignation. And they're like, oh my goodness, if you were just going to waste it, we could have at least sold it and given it to the poor. Now I'll tell you who told that, who said that here in a minute. But <clears throat> if, I, I, I googled it, what's the average wage in the United States of America right now today? It says, Google tells me, it's $60,000. Can you imagine inviting Jesus into your home and taking a vial of perfume that cost $60,000 and just dumping it over him. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, the book of John, chapter 12. <clears throat> in John, chapter 12, we read John's parallel account of this. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Everyone says, oh my goodness, this is a contradiction. Well, he came to Bethany six days before Passover. This particular event is taking place two days before the Passover. It says where Lazarus had been, uh, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary. See, John names for us the the woman that did this this was Mary who did this Martha's sister then Mary took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair so you put these two stories together Mary dumps the whole thing all over Jesus all the way down to his feet gets down on the floor uses her hair to wipe his feet this is a scandalous thing I mean this is this is this is something that no one has ever seen before. Everyone there is shocked by what Mary has done. The waste of the perfume, the, the, just, just the, the fact that she's actually doing this to Jesus, and he's not stopping her. He's not saying anything about it. It says, in the, uh, the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was, this ointment, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? and given to the poor. So, so John is letting us in on a little bit more information than Mark did in telling us Judas was the one who had a problem and who had the value of it. And he tells us this, verse 6, this he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Oh, can you just imagine? Can you imagine being the guy Who's the treasurer? I mean, they say, Judas, you're the treasurer. Like, you trust the treasurer, right? You hand him the money back. Here, keep up with the money for us. And Judas is going around stealing from the money that's been given to Jesus and to his disciples. This is the money that they travel on, that they, they buy food with, whatever they do, right? And John knows exactly what's happening. He, he, he knows this, but he doesn't know it until later. And we'll find that out as we go along as well. And so 
So what we, what we see here is, is we see Mary do something that's amazing. And then Jesus sticks up for her. They all start, oh, why was this? And Judas is the ringleader. He has indignation. That means he's upset. He's, he, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's indignant about this. He, he says, this is waste. This should have been, you know, this was not good stewardship of the gifts that God has given to you. You can just hear him. He's at every business, every single solitary business meeting. You can hear this guy. <laughs> we need to do this. We, that's not a good use of God's money, right? And, and y'all beware now if you say that. You're probably the one stealing from the church. But, no, I'm just teasing. Poor Dakota. I used to pick on Dakota. I always pick on the treasurer because Judas was the treasurer, right? That's kind of scary. But what he says here is, is he says, let her alone. Now, I love that. Jesus sticks up for her to the other guys. Let her alone. Why trouble you her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me you have not always. Now don't think that Jesus is putting down the poor here at, at all. Being mindful of the poor is something that is commanded throughout the entirety of the Bible. We are supposed to be mindful of the poor, take care of the poor when we have opportunity. Uh, that, he's not putting them down. What he's saying is, is he's saying th- there's, there's always an opportunity to do that. This is the only opportunity that Mary has to do what she just did. Because my days with you here on this earth are limited. He says, uh, she hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Now, I used to for years, every time I preached on this, I would say, Mary loved Jesus. She wanted to worship Jesus, but she didn't really know what she was doing. I have changed my mind. I think Mary knew exactly what she was doing. And let me show you why. First, turn to Luke chapter 10 if you will. Jesus has spent a lot of time with this family. He's good friends with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, a brother and his sisters. He stays at their house when he comes to Jerusalem. Bethany's not far. And so it'd kind of be like, you know, we need to be in San Angelo, but uh, while we're there, we're friends with the Ingalls, and so we're going to stay with them in Cristobal. It's, It's handy. It's a close town or whatever something like that that's what Bethany was for Jerusalem and Jesus stayed with them in Bethany quite a bit but look with me in Luke chapter 10 is starting in verse 38 another time this is a totally different time but we get a little bit of insight into who Mary really is here Luke 10 38 it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. I want, you to, I want you to make note of that. Mary heard Jesus' word. Did you know that something terrible can happen to you when this book is read? It can go in one ear and right straight out the other, and you never catch it. Happens all the time. Either that or you can hear it, weigh it against what you know, and say, nope, I reject the word. I'm going to go with what I know. That's pretty bad, too. But not Mary. She heard his word. It says, uh, verse 40, But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Can you see Jesus sticking up for Mary in both of these situations? Because in the first situation, this one here in Luke 10, Mary is actually hearing the word of Jesus. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by from? And hearing by the? When Jesus is speaking, that's the word of God. So Mary is one of those people who is hearing what Jesus says. And so Jesus says, look, Mary's made a choice here. And her choice is, is to hear my word. And guess what? When you hear Jesus' word and you believe it in your heart, it will never, ever be taken away from you. So Mary is the kind of person who listens to the Lord and she believes the Lord. Now let's go on a little survey of the book of Mark. 
And let's see something that, that Jesus has been teaching back in Mark chapter 8. So let's go back to Mark chapter 8 and let's look at verse 31. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8 verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now at this point, Peter speaks up. He spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. You see, Peter's not listening to the Lord. No, Lord, that's not going to happen. You're not going to die. And Jesus has to actually get on to Peter. And when he had turned about, verse 33, looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So Peter rebuked him, then he rebuked Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So Jesus has begun much early in, earlier in his ministry teaching the disciples, I'm going to be killed. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9. And let's look at verse 31. Mark 9, 31. <clears throat> it says, for he taught his disciples. Now, the Bible makes a distinction between the twelve. Sometimes Jesus is just with the twelve. But other times he has many more disciples around him. There's a really good chance Mary could have been present at this time. So he's not just teaching the secret to the twelve. He's teaching all of his disciples. He said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. They, they didn't get it. They wouldn't get it. They couldn't get it. They didn't like it. They didn't want to hear it. Now let's look at Mark 10 and verse 32. It says... Mark 10, 32, And they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid, and he took again the twelve. So this is, this is one time that it's just the twelve. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. So let's take and put all that together. Mary is a disciple of Jesus. Mary chooses to sit quietly at the feet of Jesus and listen and hear what he says. And when Jesus says, I'm on my way to Jerusalem and they're going to betray me and they're going to kill me, Mary believed him. And so, doing what she could with what she had, she anointed his body for the burial. I think she knew exactly what she was doing because she was a true disciple of Jesus. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the lesson from this. Be like Mary. Please be like Mary. She heard the Lord, she believed the Lord, and she acted upon what she knew to be true because she believed him. The rest of the disciples, they are in denial. They don't want to think about their Lord dying because that brings a cognitive dissonance to them. They think that the Messiah is going to come and lead them in a military victory against the Romans and the whole world. That's what they think. And guess what? Someday he will, but not on that trip. On that trip, he was on his way to the cross. If he didn't go to the cross, none of us would be saved. And Mary's listening and believing. And so she takes and, and she does this. Now let's go back to Mark 14. He sticks up for her. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. He says, verse 8, she hath done what she could. I, lo I love that. You know, there are so many things that I can't do. I mean, think about it. If Mary, Mary's sitting there, she's listening. These, these people are going to take my Lord and they're going to kill him. Well, I want to stop them. <laughs> well, do you think some poor woman from Bethany has the power to stop the political religious machine of Jerusalem? No, of course not. She could have run down there screaming and yelling. and They're going to kill Jesus. They're gonna... That wouldn't have done any good. And she knows it. But you know what she could do? She could show him the love that she had for him. Give him ext 
extravagant worship, unbelievably extravagant worship. The, probably the most precious and expensive thing that she had in her whole house. And she gave it all to him in this act of worship and preparation, knowing I only have my Lord with me for a little while, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And Jesus says this in verse 9, Verily, truly, I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world. Throughout the whole world. And here we are almost 2,000 years later. And we're talking about something that happened in Simon the leper's house. With a, a, a poor woman who took and, and broke that vial and dumped that ointment on Jesus. This also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. I remember Mary. <laughs> and now you remember Mary every time you read the Bible. Every time you read this. Every time you hear the gospel. You tell the gospel story about Jesus. You're going to tell the story about Mary. And when you tell the story about Mary, you're going to tell the story about a real disciple. A genuine disciple. Even more genuine than the next guy we're going to talk about. Who's a pure de phony. Right? Here's Mary. She did what she could you know, I think a lot of people don't serve God because they think that you have to do something huge, something massive. You have to start some ministry or you have to have some title or you have to be a part of a mega church for it to actually count or you've got to have a 501c3 or you got to... You don't have to have any of those things. Did you know with what you have, with where you are, right where you are, that you can serve Jesus? And this woman gets recognized every single... I read about her in John. I read about her in Matthew. I read about her in Mark. I read about her in Luke. Every year, as I read my Bible, I read about Mary and what Mary did because she heard his word, she believed his word, and she acted on that belief. Wow. Well, <clears throat> the third one is a satanic act of betrayal. So you've got a sneaky plan to kill Jesus. That's the religious leaders. You've got this sacrificial anointing for his burial. That's Mary. And then you've got a satanic act of betrayal. That's Judas. Look what it says in verse 10. And Judas Iscariot. We've already seen that the, the, the one who spoke up, you know, there's always got to be somebody to speak up. The one who spoke up and showed what he was all about was Judas. Why was this waste of this ointment made? That thing is worth a year's salary. That could have been sold and given to the poor. Or Judas could have been given to me because you give to the poor, you put in the bag, I take the bag and then I steal part of it for myself. That's what he'd been doing for years apparently. But let's turn to Luke this time, chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So we put this whole story together. In Luke chapter 22, let's look at verse 3. It tells us <clears throat> in, here in, in verse 10, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. But Luke tells us in Luke 22, 3, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. All of the evangelists are going to remind us, hey, don't forget, Judas is one of the twelve. Now, how sad is that? Think about where Judas has been. Judas has been there from the very beginning. He's traveled with the Lord for three uh, some odd years. He, he has seen everything that the disciples have seen. He's been there as they cast out demons. He's been there as they've healed the sick. He's seen the miraculous things. He sat there and helped serve the food that Jesus multiplied as he broke the loaves and fishes on two different occasions. He's seen Jesus heal by touching. He's seen Jesus heal by speaking. He's seen Jesus heal by not even being present. He's heard the gospel preached. He's observed the Lord's life. He's... He's seen it all. He's been a part of every bit of that, and yet, he doesn't believe. Now, let me just take a little journey right quick and just remind you, just because you are here does not mean necessarily that you're hearing the Word of God. Just because you grow up in a Christian home does not mean that you actually believe 
this book, that you have actually received Jesus for yourself. Judas is a great reminder that you can be that close to the Lord and yet still not only just reject him, but betray him. To literally betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Now please understand, we can't blame this on Satan. Because Judas already made up his mind to betray him. It was at the moment that he went ahead and said, okay, now I'm going to go do it. That's when Satan entered into him. Then entered Satan into Judas, being of the number of twelve, and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money, and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Remember, because they're scared of the crowd. We've we got we to gotta betray him, but we can't do it out in the open publicly because the crowd will mob us, right? Matthew chapter 26, verse 15, gives us a little bit more information. I put this one in your bulletin. He said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> so, in today's market, silver's worth around $30 an ounce. So Judas sold Jesus out for 900 bucks, and Mary, she dumped $60,000 on top of him. So what's he worth to you? <laughs> I, think it's, I think that the contrast between these two is just, is just unbelievable. Mary, Mary understood what it is to be a disciple. You're going to be a disciple. If you're going to be my disciple, Jesus said this. He said, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's what it is to be a disciple. And you see, Judas was following the whole time just like this, going, I'm not sure if I'm in. 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 I bet you Judas was so excited when Jesus went in and cleared, cleared the people and the, the money changers out of the temple. I bet he was like, yes, this is an act of insurrection. This is what Judas wanted. I want to fight. I want to fight. I want you to, to be the king. And I even think that they tried at least a little bit to force Jesus' hand in that because that's what they wanted. We learn at Nazareth that they wanted to make him king. And he had to sneak away from them, get out of the crowd, kind of sneak away. Because what Jesus came to do first and foremost was to seek and to save that which was lost not fight a war listen if Jesus had come and done what Judas wanted him to do we'd all still be lost we'd all still be sinful oh he might have set up the kingdom but but he had to accomplish his mission first the the mission that John the Baptist pointed out when he first saw him behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world what an incredible contrast and so this is my challenge to you this morning. How do you want to be remembered? When it comes to Jesus, when you, when you interact with Jesus, do you want to be in the religious crowd? The religious crowd who completely rejected his word. They didn't care what the Bible said. They, they looked right at Jesus and they said, eh, that's not what we want. We want to listen to the traditions of the elders, what we've been taught. Listen, folks, there's churches who do things that are not right. And it's tradition. I once listened to a debate between two friends, good friends, very good friends, both of them pastors from different denominations. The debate is on infant baptism. One of them says, church tradition, church tradition, church tradition, church tradition, church tradition, church tradition. Points to scripture a few times and says, we see here, we see this, we see that. The other one gets up and says, read the rest of that passage. These people believed. These people believed and were baptized. They believed and were baptized. They were believed and baptized. They believed and baptized. They believed and baptized. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And these are both really smart guys. But one of them, his practice lines up with the word of God. The other one, his practice lines up with his tradition, what he's learned by observation from somebody that came before him. And see, that's where the religious leaders of Jesus' day were. They held to the traditions of the elders. And if the Bible said one thing and the traditions of the elders said something different, 
The traditions of the elders trump the Bible. Oh, be careful. There's lots of cults that have another book that go with this one. They say, we believe the Bible, but we believe our book actually is the key to understanding the Bible. And so they add to it. That was the religious leaders. You know what they wanted to do? Come up with a sneaky plan to kill Jesus. Then you got Judas. And Jesus wasn't what he wanted him to be. He wanted him to be something else. Man, there's a lot of people in our world today who don't want Jesus to be who he is. They want him to be somebody else. They want him to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. They want him to, to be some kind of a, a hippie uh, uh, cult leader that, that, that leads people into insurrection against the government or something like that. They, they want for Jesus to be a revolutionary. Matter of fact, I got a book in my library, Jesus Revolutionary, and that's what it's all about, that, that Jesus was a revolutionary and we need to be revolutionaries as well. And it tells you that you need to, you know, fight the man. It sounds like something right out of the 60s, because it is. <laughs> but look what Judas did. When it came right down to it, his allegiance wound up being to Satan. Now I want you to think about it. We, we looked at this passage of scripture. When Peter, when Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. And on the third day I'm going to rise again. And Peter, Peter rebuked him. What did Jesus call Peter? He called him Satan, didn't he? And who was it that entered into, if that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, I don't know what would. Satan himself literally entered into Judas when he decides to go ahead and condemn the Lord, betray the Lord, go and sell him out, just like Ahithophel did to King David to sell him out, to betray him, to stab him in the back. Satan, this is what Jesus says. He says, you're either with me or you're against me. You either gather with me or you scatter abroad. In other words, you can't ride the fence and you can't have one foot on each side. You've got to decide. And if you're not, I mean, Peter's with Jesus. And yet, he says, you're thinking about the things of man, not the things of God. Get behind me, Satan. What an incredible, whoa, poor old Peter. But, you know what? At the end, when it all comes down to it, Judas turned his back on Jesus, betrayed Jesus, and never repented. Peter did repent. Peter's even going to deny the Lord. Jesus calls him Satan. He denies the Lord. And yet, Peter is going to repent. Peter's going to get right. Hey, listen, we, we probably at some point in our life, we've been on any and all parts of this. I don't know about you, but this is my challenge to you this morning. I want to be like Mary. Mary didn't have a privileged position. Mary didn't have a, a, a lot of money. She didn't have a, a, a big following. She didn't have a, a, a big way to make a big splash for Jesus. She simply did what she could. But I guarantee you this, when Jesus was around, Mary was listening. And when Mary heard the words of Jesus, they went into her heart and she believed what he said. And then she did what she could. And that's what a real disciple is. Mary is a real disciple. Judas is phony baloney, and Mary is the genuine article. Let's be like Mary, amen? Father, thank you for your word. God, help us. Help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. God, we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord, don't let us fall into church tradition. Don't let us fall into the, the teaching of man. Don't let us savor the things that are of man. Don't let us fall into the trap of Judas that, that when faced with going the direction that we want to go, that we decide to go in a different direction than our Lord is going. Help us, Lord, to be like Mary, to listen to you, to believe what you say, and in simple childlike faith, to simply say, you're the Lord, and I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please take just a minute.